In this video, we're going to go deeper into the geometric phase. We'll first review the adiabatic approximation. Then we'll talk about Berry's phase, how to measure Berry's phase, and finally the generalized aronov bohm effect. So a good definition of uh, an adiabatic process was given by uh, Max Born and Vladimir Fock in 1928. And this is pertaining to quantum mechanical systems. So a physical system remains in its instantaneous eigenstate if a given perturbation is acting on it slowly enough and if there is a gap between the eigenvalue and the rest of the Hamiltonian spectrum. That means that as long as the different eigenstates remain separate in energy, then if you have a slow variation in a perturbation, the state will remain the same. It will just evolve just like we discussed before uh, in the previous video. So if the time rate of change of the Hamiltonian h dot is small, we showed that the particle in the nth state, psi n zero, at time equals zero will evolve <clears throat> as psi of n of t, psi of t is equal to e to the i theta sub n of t, e to the i gamma sub n of t, two phase factors, times psi sub n of t where theta sub n of t is one, minus 1 over h bar, integral from 0 to time, time t, uh, e sub n of t prime dt prime. That's a dynamic phase factor. And the geometric phase factor, gamma sub n of t, is i times the integral from 0 to t of psi sub n of t prime, inner product with its own time derivative, uh, psi sub n of t prime d by dt of that, integrated over dt prime. And this is the geometric phase factor. So the theta sub n is the dynamic phase, and, and gamma sub n is the geometric phase. Now, if we start with the time-dependent solution, what we had previous on the previous slide, and the two definitions, uh, <clears throat> it's now possible to calculate a geometric phase from what you know what we know about the time evolution of the Hamiltonian. So if we know the time evolution of the Hamiltonian, we want to calculate the geometric phase. So the eigenstate depends on time. And the reason it depends on time is that there is some slowly varying parameter in the Hamiltonian, which is, which is changing very slowly with time. So this parameter we're going to call R of t. So we can encompass all the time variation of the Hamiltonian with this parameter, R of t. So the time derivative of the wave function, psi sub n, d by psi sub n dt, has, can be written in terms of this slowly varying parameter as d partial of psi sub n with respect to r, partial of r with respect to t. So when we take this integral of psi sub n with its own time derivative, we can now replace the time derivative by this composite derivative and realizing that r does not actually uh, come into the inner product integral, we can pull it out of the inner product integral and we get an inner product integral that looks like this. Uh, gamma sub n of t is equal to i times the integral from 0 to t of psi sub n of t prime, partial of psi sub n with respect to r, inner product, times dr dt prime integrated over dt prime. Well, the dt primes cancel. We can change the limits. And now we actually do this integral over a spatial quantity. So instead of integrating over time, we've converted this to an integral over the slowly varying parameter r. So it now becomes i times the initial state of r integrated to the final state of r of the inner product of psi sub n times its derivative with respect to r integrated by dr. So this works well for a single evolving parameter. If the system it returns to its original value rf is equal to ri if it's equivalent then the geometric phase is going to be zero remember the foucault pendulum when you go a full day around 
the pendulum returns to its original position. However, if you have more than one parameter r sub i, even if you return to the original state, there may be a non-zero uh, geometric phase factor, and we can show that too. So let's imagine that we have n parameters, which are varying slowly, that, that give the Hamiltonian time dependence, r sub 1 all the way to r sub n of t. Well, the partial derivative of psi with respect to t, then, is a sum of partial derivatives, psi sub n with respect to r sub 1, dr1 dt, and then all the way to psi sub n, partial psi of psi n with respect to r sub n, <coughs> d sub r sub n dt. And you have a sum of all of these. And we can write this uh, in, a, in a nice, uh, a nice um, shorthand as a vector equation where r1, r2, all the way to r sub n are the different components of the r vector. So this is a more than a three-dimensional r vector. It's an n-dimensional r vector. And, and this sum is simply the uh, gradient of psi sub n with respect to this r space. So there are n, di n dimensions to this. And you can see you have the inner product, you have the, the gradient in each term times with the d sub r n dt, which means that you can write this in a compact form as a dot product, scalar product, with the um, time derivative or the r vector, dr vector dt. So we've, we've recovered or we've taken psi, uh, uh, partial of psi with respect to n with respect to t and converted it to a gradient with respect to this set of uh, variables r, set of parameters r of the wave function, dotted into the time derivative of that r vector. We can now write the geometric phase a little bit differently, right? Substituting in for psi sub n, partial of psi sub n with respect to time, we get um, psi sub n of t is i times the integral from r sub i vector to r sub f vector, so the initial state of all the parameters to the final state of all the parameters, inner product of psi sub n with its gradient with respect to this series or this n-dimensional r vector, dotted into dr vector. Now, if the Hamiltonian returns to its initial form at a, to a time t, capital T, we can write that psi sub n of t is just a closed loop integral. From r sub i, it goes all the way back to r sub i, so you just have a closed loop integral, and then you have your inner product of psi sub n with its gradient with respect to this uh, multi-dimensional vector r dotted into dr. This is called Berry's phase. And Berry's phase depends only on the path taken. You notice there's no time dependence here. It doesn't depend on how long it takes to, to cover that path. It only depends on the path integral. And that by path, I mean the path through this, R, this uh, n-dimensional space of R parameters. The dynamic phase, if you recall, depends on time always. It always depends on elapsed time. So the longer you, it takes you to move from one position to the other, the, the, the more change you'll have in the uh, phase factor, the dynamic phase. Because the theta sub n of capital T is equal to minus 1 over h bar, integral from 0 to capital T, e sub n of t prime dt prime. So whatever this is, it's going to depend on the time. However, the geometric phase factor only depends on the path. Up to now, we've had assumption that the phase of the wave function is unmeasurable. 
and has no physical significance because only observables can be measured and observables require probability distribution. Now, the definition of Berry's phase, though, implies that a relative phase can actually be measured by carrying a wave function around a closed loop and back to its original state. Let's suppose we take a beam of particles and split it in two. One beam subjected to an adiabatically changing potential, the other is not. You now are going to recombine the two beams. So initially we had psi zero and we split it in two. So we have one half psi zero plus one half psi zero times the phase factor e to the i gamma. The extra phase term gamma, capital gamma, includes both the geometric and a dynamic phase. <clears throat> so we now take the uh, probability dis distribution psi squared now becomes one quarter times psi zero squared times one plus e to the i gamma times one plus e to the minus i gamma. If we multiply this out, we get one half times psi zero modulus squared times one plus cosine capital gamma. So clearly the probability distribution will vary with gamma. We can now do a little bit more manipulation and realize that this can be rewritten as psi zero modulus squared times cosine squared of gamma, capital gamma over two. What this means is that we can measure this relative phase gamma by finding cases where the cosine is maximum or zero. One such example um, it will cover in a minute. So in three-dimensional space, this Berry's phase resembles the expression for magnetic flux. This is Berry's phase, as we've written before. And here we have a diagram where we have a path that we're going to go through. So this path is where we're taking our system. We have a magnetic field here. And we can start with a flux through a surface S and, and measure that flux through a surface S of the magnetic field. The flux is given by the integral over the surface of B dot d surface element a. So this is a small surface element dA. If we replace b by its representation with the vector potential, that is uh, the uh, del cross a, then this becomes the integral over a surface of del cross a dotted into dA, which is the surface element. If we now take Stokes' theorem, we can recast this as an integral around the loop that encompasses the surface area S. And that would be a loop over the path C of A dot dr. And you can see how now this integral for the geometric phase resembles this quantity here for the flux, magnetic flux. If we now take these two integrals and make a correspondence, we see that Berry's phase can be written as a flux through a surface. So A dot dr can be then replaced by del cross A. And so we have this dotted into dr can be replaced by del cross that quantity. And so you get the, the geometric phase at a time t is equal to i times the integral of this. Remember, this is the gradient over the n-dimensional space for r crossed into the inner product of, not the gradient, but this is going to be the curl over that n-dimensional space of the inner product of psi n with the gradient of psi n with respect to this n-dimensional space, dotted into the surface area element and then integrated throughout the surface. So the Aronoff-Bohm effect is an example of Berry's phase. <clears throat>
So if you recall that in the presence of a vector potential, A, the solution of the Schrodinger equation picked up a phase factor e to the i g, where g of r is given by integral of q over h times a path integral of a dot dr. The particle that passed to the left picks up a negative phase factor because a, which is in the green arrow, representing the green arrow, and dr are in opposite directions. The particle that passes through the right side picks up a positive phase factor because of the uh, a and dr in the same direction. When they recombine, you get interference fringes. Now we can look at the generalized Aronoff-Bohm uh, experiment or Aronoff-Bohm effect as simply a calculation of Berry's phase. So let's imagine that we have a charged particle confined to a box centered at R away from a solenoid. And there's a potential V of R minus capital R that that particle is subjected to. And the center of that potential is here in the black dot. The energy times the size of N is simply equal to the Hamiltonian applied to size sub n, and that's given by 1 over 2m h bar over i del minus q times the vector potential a of r modulus all squared plus v of r minus capital R applied to psi n. We can solve this, if you recall, going back to the Aronoff Bohm expression, as psi n is equal to e to the i g, which is a phase factor times psi prime sub n, where g was just equal to q over h bar integral from capital R to R of the vector potential a of r prime d dot dr prime. So if we use this expression and this substitution for psi sub n, the, we eliminate because we're using the right gauge, we eliminate the vector potential in our Schrodinger equation, and we get that e sub n times psi sub n prime is equal to minus h bar squared over 2m del squared plus v of r minus capital R applied to psi prime sub n. We now take this system and we carry it around a solenoid by varying capital R slowly because it's adiabatic, and we calculate Berry's phase. Well, in this case, what we're varying slowly is the vector r, which is a three-dimensional uh, quantity. It's x, y, and z, the position. And so del sub r applied to psi sub n is equal to del sub r times applied to e to the i g psi prime of r minus capital R. So we now can, psi sub n, psi sub n prime has this r minus capital R, so we can take a derivative there. And g does not depend, it depends on r only as its initial uh, position. So we can rewrite this gradient with respect to our coordinate system, capital R, as minus i q over h bar a of r, capital R, e to the i g, because that's exactly what you get when you take the derivative of g. You get a of r times psi prime sub n of r minus capital R. That's the derivative of the e to the i g. And then the second term is the derivative of the, of the psi n prime, which gives you e to the i g del of sub r of psi n, sub n prime of r minus capital R. If we now take this quantity and take the inner product with psi sub n, so we have psi sub n inner product with this gradient with respect to r of psi sub n, we get integral of e to the minus i g psi prime sub n of r minus r prime complex conjugate 
times e to the i g times this quantity of two terms minus i q over h bar a of capital R psi n psi sub n prime of R minus capital R plus the gradient with respect to capital R of psi sub n prime of R minus capital R all integrated over dr cubed. Well, we're integrating over lowercase r, not capital R, so we can pull out the terms that, that have capital R. And so this first term makes it very easy. This comes all out, and you're just getting the integral goes to 1 because this function is normalized. Psi prime is normalized. So what you get out of the first term is minus i q over h bar vector potential of capital R. The second term can be rewritten. Because there's a symmetry here, psi sub n prime is a function of R minus capital R. So if we take the gradient with respect to capital R, it's the same as taking the negative gradient with respect to lowercase r. So we can replace the gradient with respect to capital R with a gradient with respect to lowercase r and add a minus sign. So we have minus the integral of psi n prime r minus r prime star times a gradient with respect to lowercase r of psi sub n prime of r minus capital R integrated over d cubed r. And that's the integral that we want to do. Now, um, for stationary states, the momentum is equal to zero. So that says that del with respect to lowercase r of psi n prime is simply the momentum. And so this term goes to zero. So this whole integral goes to zero because the momentum is zero. So the inner product of psi n with its gradient with respect to the slowly varying parameters is equal to minus i q over h bar vector potential of capital R. And when we apply Berry's formula for the geometric phase, we get that the gamma sub n of t is equal to i times the integral from the initial position to the final position of this inner product dotted into dr. If we now substitute everything in, we get q over h bar times the integral over the closed loop of the vector potential as a function of capital R dotted into dr. But this, by Stokes' theorem, is simply the curl of the vector potential integrated over the surface area. So you get q over h bar times the curl of the vector potential integrated over the surface enclosed by this loop. And this is simply the flux. So q times the magnetic flux over h bar. So this is just the flux. But this is simply the aronoff bohm effect. So doing Berry's phase for a generalized aronoff bohm effect shows that the doing the, Bar the aronoff bohm effect actually is calculating the phase of the wave function, of the relative phase of the wave function.